True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. A teenage girl is spending a Friday night with her friends. They're drinking and dancing, laughing and chatting. In the early hours of the morning, it's time to go home. The group splits up. The girl goes one way and the rest of the group go another. Two hours later, she'll be found between two empty cottages on a nearby business premises. Her injuries are unspeakable. But before she succumbs to them, she utters a name. But the question will remain whether the man was friend or foe. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 41, The Murder of Aneen Boyson. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank all of True Crime South Africa's listeners who continue to support the show through Patreon and PayPal. I don't have any new supporters to give a shout out to this week, but I'm so grateful for the ongoing support I receive from all of you. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. Patreon supporters get a shout out in the episode directly following their sign up. And they also get access to one additional exclusive Patreon episode per month. Any form of support is appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to helping the show to continue growing and improving. The case I'm covering today is quite well known in South Africa. Of course, I had heard about it when it happened in 2013. Anine Boyson became a name that was synonymous with the savagery of rape and murder of women. I often find it interesting how my memories of a case become skewed, and I think that's the same for many. I often discover that when I start researching a case, what I thought happened and what really happened are quite different. In this case, the reality compared to the idea I had in my head were like night and day. I worked off the sentencing document from the judge, which detailed the injuries that Anin sustained. And when I compared that to some of the media reports that are still available on the internet today, the level of misreporting was shocking. I'll get into the reports as well as the reality later on, But I must warn you that today's case contains descriptions of horrific injuries. Some of the seasoned doctors that treated Anin said that it was the worst case they'd ever seen. I will let you know when I'm about to describe her injuries, but there will also be unavoidable references to them throughout. So please keep that in mind if you feel that this may be triggering for you. Besides the shocking injuries sustained, there are other mysteries that surround this case, even to this day. A man is in jail for Anin's murder, but there is ongoing speculation that he may not have been the correct perpetrator, or at the very least, he didn't act alone. Let's get into episode 41, The Murder of Anin Boyson. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Anine Boyson was born on the 30th of October 1995. Her initial home life, according to records from the Department of Social Services, as well as her foster mother, was based around chronic alcohol and drug abuse by her parents, as well as domestic violence. 
Anine lived with her parents in Maltbor Strand, Western Cape, when she was born. But conditions in the home soon grew so dangerous for the children that in 1998, social workers removed her, as well as her older brother and sister. Anine was three years old when she was placed with her brother into the care of a foster mother called Kolia Ulefia. They initially lived with the woman in Maltbor Strand and then moved to Bredarsdorp. Despite having her children removed, Anine's biological mother did not stop having children. And in 2008, she would be convicted of the culpable homicide of a child that she had given birth to after Anine had been removed. Anine's father worked on a farm, but also made little effort to maintain contact with his children. Although Kolia Ulefia was a court-appointed guardian for Anine and her brother, I must wonder how much research was done into the background of the woman and whether social workers actually continued to check in on the children, as it's alleged that Ulefia also had an alcohol abuse problem and she would regularly tell Anine to leave the house and find somewhere else to sleep if she wanted to entertain male friends. These allegations would be made by a friend of Anine's, to whom she would often go for a place to sleep when these incidents happened. After one such incident in 2009, when Anine was 14, the girl refused to go back to her foster mother, and between 2009 and 2013, she lived with a friend. Anine struggled academically, and when she was 15, she was already three grades behind where she should have been. And without the support of a family to keep her in school, she decided to drop out. I cannot say for sure what the nature of Anine's academic problems were, but I do know that children with fetal alcohol syndrome, which occurs when a mother abuses alcohol during pregnancy, often struggle with learning disabilities. Of course, I also can't prove that her mother did abuse alcohol while she was pregnant with Anine, but considering the home circumstances and her ultimate conviction for the manslaughter of another child, it is highly likely. Anine would live with her friend until early 2013, when she decided to move back in with her foster mother. She was described as a quiet girl, who was not usually interested in going out to parties or pubs, and would spend most of her time at home watching television. Before we get into the details of the events of February 2013, I want to describe Bredarsdorp and the community that Anine lived in to you, so that you can get an idea of the dynamic she was living in. Bredarsdorp is about 187 kilometres, or 2 hours and 15 minutes drive from Cape Town. It's a town that predominantly runs on seasonal agricultural activity, so there are very few permanently employed people there, and most communities live far below the breadline. Bredarsdorp is a beautiful, sleepy town of about 15,000 residents. But the culture that has developed around seasonal work, or often no work at all, has seen alcohol and drug abuse become an enormous problem. With those substance abuse problems comes violence, and it would emerge after Anine's murder that most of the residents of her community had become so desensitised to violence, especially rape, that it didn't surprise them. Drinking had become a pastime of sorts in this area, as it has in many other poverty-stricken places in South Africa. And the problem is only made worse by the more than 40 illegally operated taverns in the area, giving people alcohol on credit. It would also become clear that it was not just the adults that were indulging. Children in Bredarsdorp were growing up fast, and with many of them not having structured home lives, they were simply left to their own devices, which often meant they would go down the same alcohol and drug abuse road as their parents. At this point, Anine was 17 years old, 
And although it is not legal in South Africa for anyone under the age of 18 to drink, it would not be completely unheard of for a teenager of that age to drink with her friends in any community, really. On Friday the 1st of February 2013, at around 5pm, Anine told her foster mother that she was going to the pub with friends. Her foster mother would later say that she did find this strange, as she didn't know Anine to enjoy the pub atmosphere. But I think it's really important to remember that Anine had been living outside of the home for four years, and her foster mother likely wouldn't be up to date with the girl's interests. Corlia agreed to let her go, but reminded her that her curfew was 10pm. Anine did not go directly to the local pub, though. Instead, she went to her friend's house, where a group of her friends had gathered and they started drinking there. Anine also did not go home at 10pm. Instead, between midnight and 1am, she accompanied the group of friends to the bar they had intended to go to, a place called Cully's Bar, which was close to their homes. Some of the people from the house party joined, and they also met other friends at the bar. Among them was 22-year-old Johannes Kana and Jonathan Davids, whose nickname was Zwei. Anine didn't know Johannes very well at that point, but one of her friends said that she did have a crush on the good-looking young man. She did know Jonathan Davids, though, and had for several years. Anine's foster mother says that when the girl hadn't returned by her curfew, she and a male friend went to look for the girl between midnight and 1am. Olafia admits that she had also been drinking and was drunk when she went out to look for Anine. Outside of Kali's bar, they found a large group of young people. Among them stood Anine, and a young man who would later be identified as Johannes Kana who was standing behind her, with his arms around her. Olifia approached Anine and started to argue with her, insisting that she come home immediately. Anine refused, saying she'd be home when she was ready. And eventually, Olifia left her there, returning home with her friend. Other members of the party testified that the group broke up somewhere between two and three in the morning, and the last time they'd seen Anine, she was walking with Johannes Kana towards the Asla Construction Company site, about 250 metres away from Kali's pub. Asla Construction is a foundational business in Bredasdorp. They've built thousands of RDP houses for the town's residents and are a source of employment opportunities. The business's building sites are patrolled by security guards 24-7, and the early hours of the 2nd of February were no different. Security guard Frederick Fourry inspected his portion of the grounds on a rotational basis, and at 3.35am he patrolled an area where two new cottages had been built. The cottages were not yet occupied. As was his habit, Fouri would shine his torch down each lane between the buildings, making sure that no vandals or other intruders were hiding between the cottages. When he checked the area at 3.35am, there was nothing strange to report. He continued on with his patrol rotation between the buildings, and as he was returning to his post at 4.10am, he passed the space between the new cottages again, and this time he heard a low moaning sound. He shone his torch down the lane and saw the figure of a woman laying on the ground. Fari immediately radioed his supervisor for backup, concerned that whoever had harmed the woman might still be in the area. Within minutes, Eben Mertz arrived and together the men approached the girl. Mertz could see that the woman was seriously injured, so he stayed with her while Fari phoned the police, 
and an ambulance. Constable Ricardo Mertz, I'm not sure if he's related to the supervisor or not, and Constable Josephs, arrived on the scene within five minutes. Please note that I am about to get into some graphic descriptions. Constable Mertz would later testify that when he approached a young girl, he noticed that she was laying on her back and that her pants were pulled down to her ankles. He saw that her eyes were swollen. When he approached, the girl tried to get up, but her legs collapsed underneath her and she fell onto her stomach. He saw at this time that there were streaks of blood all along her buttocks and back, and that there was something protruding between her legs. He initially thought that she may be giving birth, but upon closer inspection, he realised that it was in fact an intestine that he was seeing. He says that although she was moaning, when he tried to speak to her, she was unable to communicate with him. Understanding the severity of the situation, he decided to go to the nearby hospital to accompany the ambulance so that they could find the spot quicker. The ambulance arrived on the scene between 4.30am and 4.45am that morning. The paramedic, who would later testify in court, said that when he arrived, he pulled his vehicle right up to the scene so that he could use his headlights to work. He noticed that the girl's face was covered in bruises and blood. He administered a drip and used the contents of another drip to clean the protruding intestine and attempted to put it back into her body to prevent further damage and infection. The girl at this point was unable to speak, but the paramedic noticed a tattoo on her shoulder. It read, Anine Boyson. When he asked the girl if that was her name, she was able to nod. 17-year-old Anine Boyson's night of fun had ended in a savage attack. The ambulance driver found a striped hat nearby and, assuming it belonged to Anine, placed it on the stretcher with her. She was loaded into the ambulance and taken to Bredasdorp Hospital. At this point, the police officers did something a bit strange. The ambulance requested an escort to the hospital, and instead of leaving one officer behind to secure the scene, both officers left, leaving the scene in the charge of the security guard. The paramedics said that once Anine was in the ambulance, she sat up and asked for some water. Anine Boyson was rushed to the closest hospital, Otto Duplessis Hospital in Bredasdorp. The initial examination showed the true horror of what Anine had endured. I'm going to give you yet another graphic description warning here. The first doctor to examine Anine would testify that the girl's eyes were both bruised and swollen. Her lips were also swollen and bloody. She had bruises all over her face and body, as well as blood coming from her ear. Anine's colon and small intestine had been able to exit her body because the perineum, which is the area that separates the vagina and the anus, had been completely destroyed. Despite the paramedics' attempts to reintroduce her organs to her body, they had exited again. The doctor also noted that parts of the girl's intestine were missing, including the section of the intestine that provides blood flow to the organ. This meant that attempting to replace the organ into the body would not reinstate the blood flow. With the victim's name now known, police arrived at the home of Corlea Ulefia and transported her to Otto Duplessis Hospital. Corlea says that when she saw Anine, the girl was slipping in and out of consciousness. She asked her who had done this to her, and Corlea says that Anine had answered, Zwei and his friends. 
a nurse would later say that the girl had also said something to her about six men having been involved in the attack. Kolia left Anine at Otto du Plessis Hospital and returned home. I don't know if she was instructed to leave or if Anine was in the ICU and she wasn't allowed to stay. But it's very sad to me that Anine, who clearly had some awareness at that stage about what was going on around her, was all alone during that time. A few hours after being admitted to Otto du Plessis Hospital, Anine was transported to Worcester Hospital by road, which is a two-hour drive. She was assessed there by Dr. Storm Bissicht, who determined that the girl needed to see a specialist surgeon to save her intestine and her life, and she was again transferred to another hospital, Tigerberg, which is another hour from Worcester. At 5pm that afternoon, she was assessed by specialist surgeon Dr. Liesel Taylor at Tigerberg Hospital. Dr. Taylor testified that upon entering Anine's room, she found the girl on a monitor, and she became aware of the smell of decomposition. When she examined the intestine, she saw that it was already starting to change colour, and despite all of the attempts to keep the organ protected inside her body, it was now no longer viable. It would also be discovered that due to the breaking down of the perineum, which essentially protects the rest of the body from fecal matter, bacteria from her feces started to spread throughout her body and her organs were starting to shut down. At this point, Dr. Taylor knew that surgery was going to be impossible and they intubated Neen and attempted to stabilise her. Kolia Ulefia was, during this time, being driven from Bredarsdorp to Tigerberg by a policeman. However, she would not make it there in time. At nine o'clock on the evening of the 2nd of February, Anine's body gave up the fight for life, and she passed away. All three doctors that had treated Anine, even the specialist surgeon with decades of experience, expressed that they had never seen anything so horrific, having been inflicted upon a human being. All three doctors also agreed that there was no way that even penile rape by multiple offenders would have caused so much damage, and that there had to have been another implement involved. While Anine had been fighting for her life, the investigation had started immediately. At the scene, police had used a dog trained to pick up bodily fluids to find any implements which could have been used in the crime. A steel pipe, several large sticks and a rock was found covered with blood. A very small amount of blood was present at the site, which seemed strange considering the considerable injuries that had been incurred but the wine glass that Anine had been seen walking away with from the bar was found smashed nearby. Police also found pieces of human tissue on the ground and splattered against a nearby wall, which they believed to have come from the attack on Anine. The hat which had gone with Anine to the hospital was handed over to police as evidence. An autopsy conducted on Anine's body noted that she had been severely beaten. The complete destruction of the perineum was noted as well as the missing tissue from the intestines. The piece of human tissue found at the scene was handed to the forensic pathologist and she confirmed that this was indeed the missing section of Anine's intestine. The pathologist believed that even penetration with an object would likely not have caused the kind of damage she had seen. Although she believed that Anine was indeed penetrated with a foreign object, she also thought that the destruction of the perineum was actually caused by blunt force trauma. Anine's attacker, or attackers, had not only raped her, 
but they had also beaten her vaginal and anal area with such force that the tissue in that area had become completely pulverized. It also seemed evident that the injuries would have been as a result of multiple blows. The offender would have struck Anine several times, rested, and then continued. Again, the seasoned professional confirmed that this was the worst injury she had ever seen from a sexual assault. Back in Bredarsdorp, Anine's friends were being made aware of what had happened to her. Police quickly determined the girl's last movements and interviewed each partygoer individually. I was quite impressed by the number of different units that came to work together on this case. Perhaps the Bredarsdorp police realised that they simply didn't have the resources or the expertise to work on a murder like this, because they called in an officer from the Sexual Offences Unit in Hermanus to kick off the investigation. The officer quickly realised that Johannes Karner's name was coming up as the last person seen with Anin from several sources, and she interviewed the young man at his house on the Sunday after Anin had died. Johannes Karner admitted that he'd been with Anin, but said that he'd left her outside the pub. He claimed he called out to her foster mother on the other side of the road and told her to take the girl home because she was drunk. He had then left the bar alone. The officer noticed that Connor had an injury to his ear, and when she asked him what had happened, he said he didn't know. She also noticed that, that despite it being quite warm that day, he wore a long sleeve shirt, and he had the sleeves pulled down over his hands. She asked him if he'd show her his hands, and when he did, she saw that his knuckles were cut and bruised and starting to scab over. Again, he had no explanation for how this could have happened. Jonathan David, nicknamed Zwei, who'd been named by Anin as one of her attackers, was also interviewed. He claimed that he left the pub at midnight and had gone home. One of the most disturbing aspects of this case for me is how people that had been there that night, who called themselves Anine's friends, had initially lied to police in an attempt to take the heat off Johannes Karner. They knew that he had been the last person seen with her. They had seen the pair walking toward the site where Anine would later be found. And by that point, they also knew the full horror of what had happened to their friend. But they still protected Karner. One girl initially said that she had walked home with Connor that night. She would later recant that statement. Some of the young people there that night, though, did tell the truth, and it was through them that police were able to determine that the hat found at the scene belonged to Johannes Connor. Even though he said he'd never seen it before, Many people confirmed that he had been wearing that hat the night they'd all been at the pub. While the investigation was escalating quite quickly, once the media got hold of the story, all hell broke loose. Clearly police were not going to give exact details of Anine's injuries up front, but they did mention that the girl had been disemboweled, and I think that it was this word that started a whole range of inaccurate reporting in the media. It seems that the minute the word was used, people jumped to the incorrect assumption that the disembowelment had happened through an incision in an in stomach. When I was conducting my research, I found articles by well-respected news establishments that are still up on the web today that state as fact that Anine Boyson's stomach was cut open, her throat was slit, and a wine bottle was inserted into her vagina. One reporter claimed that both of Anine's legs were broken, all her fingers were broken, her throat was slit, her vagina was cut, and her intestine was separated from the body. 
When I approached the media house for comment, I must commend them for getting back to me quickly. I was told that not all of Anine's injuries were included in the judgment document. And while that may be the case, the testimony does state that there was no sharp implement used in the injuries to her genital area. And all three doctors testified that her intestines were not separated from her body at any time. I can't really imagine why broken legs and fingers would not be included in the judgment, as this is material to the amounts of violence used. But I guess, unless we actually read the autopsy report firsthand, we'll never know. The other thing that got spread around, which there was no proof of, was that Anine had been gang raped. This likely stemmed from her own statement of six men having attacked her as well as the extent of her injuries. But there was no proof of this. Sadly, due to the extent of the injuries, it was also impossible to extract DNA samples from her. To be fair, we still don't know that she wasn't gang-raped. By the 8th of February, police had arrested three men. Johannes Connor, Jonathan Davids, and another unnamed man. On the 10th of February, a member of the investigative psychology unit interviewed Johannes Kana in an attempt to get a confession. Kana eventually admitted that he had been with Anin that night. He said that they'd walked to the Asla construction site and started to kiss. He said he wanted to have sex with Anin, but she didn't want to. He then admitted that he had started to beat her. Anine had fallen to the ground, and he kicked her. When she was no longer fighting back, he raped her. He claimed that that was all he did. He didn't know about the injuries to her genitals, he claimed. When he left, she was lying on the ground a bit confused. He hoped she would pass out and not remember what had happened when she woke up. There seemed little chance, though, that in the 35 minutes that had passed from when the security guard did his first check at 3.35am to when he found Anin at 4.10am, Connor could have brutally beaten and raped her and then left her there for another gang of men to find and that they would have still had time to do all the horrendous things that were done to her without being seen. We cannot ignore that the victim herself allegedly said that there were at least six perpetrators and named Jonathan Davids. David says that he and Anine were close and that she would more than likely have been telling her foster mom to get him to help her, not that he was the perpetrator. I don't know. We can't speak on Anine's behalf. And while the timeline makes it seem unlikely that other perpetrators stumbled upon Anine after Khan had left, it doesn't discount the possibility that they were there with him, that he set it up for them to be there, and that they all attacked her at the same time. Whether or not this is the case, the police said that they did not have sufficient evidence to lay charges against anyone else except Johannes Khanna. And in June 2013, he entered a guilty plea to the rape charge and a not guilty plea to the murder charge. The National Prosecuting Authority rejected his guilty plea on the rape charge, saying that they would prove that if he was guilty of the rape, then he was also guilty of the murder. Connor's trial began in October 2013 in Swellendam and was presided over by Judge Patricia Goliath. The state presented more than 20 witnesses and also undertook an in loco inspection of the route that Anine would have taken after leaving the bar. Several members of the community came out to support Connor at this inspection. The state was unable to present much physical evidence that actually linked Johannes Connor or anyone else for that matter, to Anine's murder. His hat was there, 
and it did have blood on it. But some witnesses claimed that the hat had been lost that night, and when Khan had left the bar, he wasn't wearing it. The case was built almost entirely on circumstantial evidence. But of course, Connor did admit to having raped Anin. And from there, it wasn't a far stretch to believe that he killed her too. Connor did not present much of a defence. He didn't take the stand to testify and his attorney relied on pointing out some of the blunders that had been made by police, which could have impacted the evidence. This would simply not be enough. And Johannes Connor was found guilty of both the rape and murder of Anine Boyson. On the 30th of October 2013, the day that Anine would have celebrated her 18th birthday, Johannes Connor arrived for his sentencing, sporting a prison tattoo that raised a few eyebrows and, for some, a few questions. Connor, it seemed, had been inducted into the 28th gang, somewhere between his arrest and his conviction, and he sported their gang insignia on his body now. The 28s are a so-called bloodline of the Numbers Gang, which includes the 26s and the 27s. The gang has been active in South Africa for many decades, and they are very active in the prisons, especially Polsmoor in the Western Cape. Connor's family had no knowledge of him being involved in a gang before his arrest, so it's entirely possible that he only became involved with them when he realised he was going to be in prison for a very long time and needed protection. Some say, though, that Connor's sudden affiliation is proof that Anine's murder was not just his doing and that he is possibly protecting other gang members that were involved. Johannes Connor was, was handed down two life sentences, one for the rape and one for the murder. His family, though, were not entirely convinced that he was guilty, or if he was, that he had indeed acted alone. They proceeded to hire two private investigators who were able to gather some information that would have many doubting the man's guilt. It was alleged by the family that an eyewitness who had information that would cast doubt on Connor's guilt was ignored by Pradarsdorp police. The city press would report a ream of information that they said the PIs had gathered, including two people claiming to have seen a group of men washing blood from a car in a cemetery the day after Anine was killed. Another two people said that they had picked up one of the men who was initially arrested for the crime when he was hitchhiking the day after Anine's murder. They say that the man was carrying a bundle of clothes under his arm and he had a scratch on his face. He asked them for a bag as he said he wanted to dispose of the clothes that he was carrying. The dog handler, who had identified these sticks and rock with blood on them at the scene, questioned why those items were never presented as evidence during the trial. This man, who claimed to have seen drag marks at the scene, indicated that Anine was attacked somewhere else and only discarded in the place where she was found. This was actually raised in the testimony in court too, and the judge said that this didn't make sense because the wine glass that Anine carried out of the bar was found at the scene, and he felt that she surely would have dropped that glass the moment she was attacked, proving that where she was found was indeed where the crime took place. One of the PIs said that one of the initial suspects had blood on his shoes, and that a community member had given clothing to police belonging to a man that she believed to be a suspect. It's alleged that the clothing was never processed as evidence. The PIs, despite being hired by the family, actually do believe that Johannes Connor committed the rape. They just don't believe that he was the only one involved. Despite the collection of all of this testimony, 
Connor did not lodge an appeal at the time of his sentencing, as he couldn't pay for an attorney. In 2014, a year after Anine's murder, her foster mother, Corlia Olifia, passed away from cancer. A few months later, her biological father was also found murdered near Bradarsdorp. He had been dumped on a rubbish pile just outside of town. The community's reaction to Anine's murder spoke volumes about the level of sexual violence in that area. Most were really not shocked or even terribly dismayed that she'd been raped. It was only the nature of the murder that stirred any real surprise. Which begs the question, what are women in these communities living with that they've become so conditioned to find this acceptable? Do they simply see rape as a fact of life and something that is likely going to happen to them at some point? Unfortunately, this would not be the last time that Bredarsdorp would see a rape and murder of this nature. In 2015, on the same day that Anine was killed two years before, five-year-old Katie Williams was kidnapped, raped and murdered in Bredarsdorp. A man was arrested for a murder, but he committed suicide after his arrest and it was eventually determined that the DNA found on Katie did not match the man they'd arrested. The little girl's killer has never been identified. Shortly after Katie was murdered, the body of of 14-year-old Elna Jafter was found underneath her boyfriend's bed. No one could explain how a 14-year-old girl had been living with a 27-year-old man for more than a year without any questions being raised. In 2016, the body of 23-year-old Sulnita Manho was found very close to the place where Anine was found. Sulnita incurred injuries very similar in nature to Anine's and was also raped with a foreign object. Sulnita had also been at a local tavern when she was last seen. A man called Dalvigo Ward would eventually be found guilty of of Solnita's murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. In 2018, 16-year-old Jodine Peters was raped, murdered, and her body was set alight 950 metres from the home she shared with her three siblings and single mom. Her murderers were identified as young men she knew well. Before Anine was murdered, the last case of this nature in Bredarsdorp occurred in the year 2000. Thirteen years later, it seemed like Anine's murder opened the floodgates in the sleepy town, and suddenly gruesome sexual murders against young girls became the norm. But perhaps it wasn't that sudden after all. Perhaps it was simply an accumulation of the acceptance of rape and a desensitisation to the violence in that area that culminated in these perpetrators taking their crimes to the next level. After the murders of Vernine, Katie and Solnita, a DA spokesperson questioned whether there was a serial killer in the area. Despite the similarities in location and manner of death, I don't think that's the case. I think that what's brewing in Bredarsdorp, and in many other communities in South Africa, is far worse than a serial killer. It's the legacy of what we've come to accept as normal. Alcohol and drug abuse, single or no parent families, domestic violence, rape culture and the complete desensitisation of people who live in these circumstances on a daily basis. This, in my opinion, has snowballed into a generation of people who think it's completely acceptable to take what they want by any means necessary. And that is a terrifying thought. Anine Boyson was every girl in every poverty-stricken community 
across South Africa and the world. She was the girl who was born into circumstances she doesn't deserve and then is let down at every step along the way. Anine Boyson walked out of her foster mother's home on the 1st of February with the intention of having some fun. Maybe she'd learned from the adults around her that alcohol was the best way to do that. She would likely have felt safe in a large group, surrounded by people she counted as her friends. Sadly, when the chips were down, no one seemed very concerned about what Anine had gone through. Most of her so-called friends protected her killer. And so, she was let down again. Some say that justice was done for Anine, her killers behind bars after all. But really, we don't even know that to be true. And even if we arrested and convicted others for what happened to her that night, would that even be justice? Because what would really make up for everything that came before that? Every failure, every slap, every punch, Every time someone turned a blind eye to her struggle. Every time a woman was raped in Bredasdorp before that day. And every time people protected the men who'd done it. They built another stepping stone to what would happen to Enin. So perhaps our only form of recourse is to reverse our own desensitisation and stop accepting that women get raped, and that alcoholic parents beat and abuse their children, and that poverty results in violence. Maybe we need to stop telling rape survivors that they should be grateful they escaped with their lives, and start asking how many surviving rape victims it takes to get to Anine. I'm sorry, Anine. You deserved better. You deserved to have parents that weren't abusive addicts. You deserved a foster mother who wasn't dealing with her own demons. You deserved help in coping with your schoolwork. You deserved friends that understood the meaning of the word. And to go out for a night on the town and return safely. You deserved to have someone holding your hand in your final moments on earth. Rest gently, Anine. Thank you for listening to episode 41, The Murder of Anine Boyson. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a mini-sode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. Bye.